Hey everyone, and welcome to the Rare Liquid Podcast, where our goal is to help you build your dream careers. And today is a very special interview where I'm going to be interviewing my Wharton MBA classmates who just summer interned at Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and JP Morgan, commonly known as the three top bulge bracket banks in the world. And so we're going to just dive straight into the interview. Just real quickly, if you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc., you can find this video actually on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube and you want to listen on the go, you can find this as a podcast on those platforms I just mentioned. All right, so let's just jump straight into it. Ed, can you first start off with your background and we'll kind of rotate clockwise? Yeah, certainly. Thanks for having me. So I'm Ed, uh, originally from Botswana. I did corporate banking before. I uh, just interned in, in investment banking at Morgan Stanley this past summer. Hi, I'm Alonso. I'm from Lima, Peru. Um, before Warden, I was doing private equity based out of Lima, covering Latin America, and did JP Morgan m and in the summer. And I'm Eunice. Before Wharton, I was outside of the D.C. area and I was working in consulting. Got it. And why did you guys each decide to go into banking? We'll go counterclockwise this time. Yeah, that's a great question. I think <laughs> uh, sometimes I, I wonder myself now. Uh, I would say three reasons. One, uh, I all the people that I've met who had come from banking, I thought were super competent, um, just like really, really good at working and I think that that's a skill that you only learn when you're actually in the industry. Um, so wanted to respect that, wanted to emulate that. Um, I come from a non-finance background and that's part of why I came to Wharton to, to kind of build that skill and um, fill that knowledge gap. And so that's kind of why I wanted to come into banking, I would say. For me, it was a lot about being able to see transactions on a large scale, um, doing private sector in Peru and in Latin America. It's very interesting, but I also wanted to learn how things are done in bigger markets, especially in, out of New York. Uh, and banking kind of gave me that that, that window. Um, so it was that and also learning how to um, deal with clients and create and manage relationships, which is something that I, I, I didn't do before. So that was kind of the, the appeal of the job. Yeah, I think very much similar to Alonso, that bigger developed market context out of New York was a big appeal. And then, of course, the fast paced lifestyle that banking is with a lot of learning, a lot of technical um, skill set development that was a big, big, big reason. Awesome. And we'll kind of now go into a lot of your guys' experience. And we're so fortunate to have people at the top three bulge bracket banks and share. And it'd be great to just for the audience to hear a lot of your guys' experience throughout your internship. And starting with you, Ed, can you tell us about some of your, your some of your responsibilities when you were working this past summer and your most rewarding deliverable? Yeah, so the responsibilities essentially plug into existing deal teams and you work on live deal transactions or with pitches and sort of business development work. Um, so I this past summer, I did a couple of M&A transactions and a few business development pitches as well. And what that looks like on a day-to-day -day is you help out with client deck pitches or uh, business development pitches that the bank will be preparing. Um, then whenever there's a roadshow or something similar to that or a client presentation, that will be the output that the bank shows uh, to the client. Uh, so that's a lot of the work that we did. Secondly, we also had to do some Excel work. So valuations whenever necessary. Um, third, a lot of industry research and comparable company research. I found just setting the scene uh, was a lot of back-end work in order to put all that information onto a, a slide deck. So that was really, really exciting for me. And the one exciting deliverable I did was on this one live transaction that we were working on, and we had to put together a deck that had quite a bit of back and forth between ourselves and the client, and we did some rehearsals with the client and then to actually see the client deliver it right at the end and the live product, the final thing, it was it was just so amazing and rewarding to see the thing that we had been working on for so long finally be seen uh, by other people besides ourselves. It was a rewarding experience for sure. I, uh, I actually sympathize with that. Um, yeah, in my case, in my case work, work very similar, um, but I would say the most rewarding experience was definitely when I get to work on something first that was live, 
but also where I got some responsibilities and I could see what the impact was on the process and, and, and on the deal in general. In, in this particular case, um, I was given a Q&A during due diligence um, and I, I was able to manage a relationship with the client and actually see uh, the impact that I had uh, on the deal uh, and not just being behind the scenes. So I felt uh, that was pretty reward rewarding. Yeah. Mm. And Eunice, when you think about what was the biggest personal and professional skill that you gained throughout your internship, what would you, what comes to mind for you? Um, I think personal, and this is something that I'm still working on, is being intentional with my time. I think it's a given, I'm sure we're going to talk about it, that it's a lot of hours. And so uh, each hour, I would say each minute becomes more precious. And uh, I think it made me more focused in what I want to do with the time that I have, the, the little free time that I have. And I, and I think that's a skill that I'm continuing to refine of making sure that I actually live out the priorities that I set for myself. On a professional level, I would say uh, one of the skills that I didn't think that I would uh, I would find as important. I was more stressed about the technical aspect, to be honest, but something that I found really important is just people and relationship management. I think coming in, especially as an MBA associate intern, you're kind of in an awkward role within a deal team. Um, you have several years of experience, and but unless you're coming from banking, uh, you have no experience in investment banking. Um, you're an intern, but you are able to kind of onboard quickly because you've worked before. And so just making sure that in all of, in some of my teams, I feel like I was definitely kind of, I reported to an analyst essentially in other teams. I like, I found myself working directly with a VP. And so just being able to flex and also make sure that everyone else on the deal team is up to date and also happy with the way that responsibilities are distributed. I think that was a, a skill that I learned. Was any of this, was a lot of this skills that you gained from personally just working through things or was there a lot of feedback that was given and that's how you learned? Um, I think feedback, feedback culture depends on the bank from what I've heard. At least in my office, it depended on the team. Like sometimes I got direct feedback. I think uh, it's easier to get more concrete feedback about something like a model, just like formatting or the way to do things. I think it's harder to get feedback about communication. And so yeah. I think mm -hmm. the comms part was more personally learned. Mm. Um, yeah. Was there any feedback you guys got throughout your internships that was particularly valuable? Well, in, in, in my case, uh, we got a structured feedback process, basically um, mid, mid internship feedback and final feedback. Um, I, I found it, but I think what Eugenius was saying was, was very important in the end. The most useful feedback is the one you get in the moment. Um, Attention to detail. Um, if you do a mistake on on something particular and they correct you, make sure to not do it again. And I think that's those are the kinds of when you apply, you can apply that feedback immediately. And if you do, it, I think it makes a difference. So I found that feedback particularly valuable. Is there anything that comes to mind for you? Or yeah, I mean, talking to people and being very sort of upfront and having zero ego about seeking out that feedback is important. Because sometimes you'd think something that's a strength of yours is annoying to other people. <laughs> um, not that it happened to me, but it's, it's just something that you need to really just like let go of your ego and ask for it. So there were instances where I intentionally just picked up the phone or, hey, can we ha have a quick chat? And then I just wanted to know if there's this that we did right. And then you won't notice that you'd be thinking that someone would tell you about that deck or that uh, that model and in fact, they'll tell you about something else. Uh, so it's something that maybe you were blind to or just mm. like not paying attention to. So Got it. uh, it's important to take all that feedback, both in the moment and ones that are a little bit more on the, I guess, you sort them out later. Yeah, and how much of your guys' time was spent more on technical aspects and how much was spent more on PowerPoint communication, like organizing meetings or talking, speaking with the client or having meet, met, meetings with your MDs, how would you categorize the different parts of your job? I'd say 30% technical, 50% models, sorry, 50% decks and advertising, sorry, uh, arranging a deck. And then the remaining 20 between client emails and uh, meetings internally. I don't know if that's representative. In my case, um, because, also because it was uh, M&A, which is product, um, which is a, a bit different um, 
to, to coverage or industry groups. It was a bit more, I would say, 70, 80% on the technical part, um, a lot of valuation work um, and modeling, and then the rest uh, managing process. So due diligence, meetings with client, and but it was mostly, mostly technical work. Yeah. yeah how about you, Eunice? I would say it's the inverse, um, but I was at a I guess, industry group team. Um, but I also would say, like, just from my floor, I think the way that staffings worked in my office were based on background. So they didn't put me immediately on like a live deal and give me a model when I've never worked in banking before. But I think other interns who have come from a more technical background had a different experience. But for me, I would say it was like 60, 70% PowerPoint slash the Excel backup that like did a chart to put into that PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the rest of it is a mix of just client meetings, admin, internal meetings, scheduling meetings with partners always takes an insanely large amount of time. Yeah. So, things like that. No, I was also in a coverage group. So I remember sometimes all I did was just meetings back to back, especially if you're doing like equity offerings. I remember one time I actually had double booked meetings and I was literally on two calls, like one on my cell phone and one on the Cisco phone or whatever. But moving on now to something that's a little bit more of a quote unquote spicy question. Anything, any kind of frustrating moment that you guys might have had on the job? And let me preface everything by saying, of course, every job has its frustrating moments. Does any particularly stand out to any of you guys? Maybe starting with uh, Eunice. Yeah. Uh, happy to start. I think first and foremost, the frustrations are personal. Um, I think anyone who is in our kind of our background or going into investment being and they want to do well at work. And it's very frustrating to be very bad at your job when you first start. Like More so, it bothered me a lot more than I thought it would. Uh, but I think some some things that are I guess unique to the industry is the unpredictability of scheduling and just you don't know when something I can commit to like social plans outside because even a week ahead, you're like, I just really don't know what's going to happen that night. I could maybe sign off at seven, um, unlikely, but I can maybe sign off at seven or I might be home at 3 a.m. Like it just depends. Um, and I think that speaks a little bit more to the process, of, the process of banking. So um, just not knowing when things are going to happen and sometimes feeling like that can be predicted or managed uh, so that you have a better sense. But um, when you are an intern and trying to learn, um, I, I don't think you have as much of a say, to be honest. Yeah. How about? Yeah, how I, about I resonate answer? with that so much. Like the idea that I think I'm intelligent and competent and then you plug into a completely new environment and you just look, at, you're looking like a fish out of water. <laughs> so that adjustment period from one, accepting that it's going to take time to learn and be a little bit more competent. And then secondly, the actual learning process itself, those were frustrating as crazy. So I, I totally resonate yeah. with that. And it happened even in my old job before when someone give you an instruction and you think you get it and then you're sitting down to try to do it and then you're like, wait, uh, is this, does this step come before or after? So. Yeah. And you know, actually I remember literally my first week when I was an analyst, I spent, I think it was like 80 hours and I was working on the weekend and I was trying to find um, public metrics for a private transaction that happened. And so it was like impossible, but I didn't know <laughs> that it was impossible until this m and associate just walked by. And then I asked him like, yo, I am struggling so hard on this. How do I find this metric? And he's like, oh, you can't find that. And so <laughs> stuff like that, you just like are slow at the beginning because you just don't know a lot of things, but you kind of build your skills over time. I'm sure that will happen with all of you guys as you go back to the workforce and all That's that. That's the hope. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, but moving on to kind of on a related note, I guess. So IB obviously is very work. The work-life balance is very tough. And so as you guys were going through a, I think the internship's a little bit different in the sense that it's more of a sprint rather than a marathon versus like the full time is more of a marathon than a sprint. But with that said, how did you guys either counteract the tough work-life balance or did you? how did you see, what kind of advice were you given? Alonzo, maybe starting with you. Yeah, I think well, it's it's a it's a difficult question because yeah, it's, it's long hours and and sometimes it's just hard to to take a break. Um, 
But something we would do in, in, in the group, and I'll probably enjoy it more uh, once I go back uh, full time, is uh, there is this this short period of time, one, one hour uh, at 6 p.m., where you can, you're basically free to do whatever mm -hmm. you want. Um, it's called flex time. And, and I, I really like that because it gives you the liberty to go to the gym or just go out and eat something uh, and then uh, go back to work. Uh, but I think that helps a lot, um, especially when you've been having like a, lo a long day. Um, and then on the weekends, you just have to manage your, your schedule. Sometimes you'll have time, sometimes you won't. And it's just keeping yourself motivated and knowing why you're doing this job and, and, and looking at the bright side and then just using whatever time you have left to enjoy yourself and, and do some sports and go out. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a job that requires you to keep, um, to keep yourself focused, but also relaxed in a sense that you don't, because if not, you just burn out and, and that's something you, you definitely want to, to avoid. Yeah, yeah. I would echo that. I think self-awareness is pretty important in this job because I mean, most corporate jobs will take whatever you are willing to give. I think banking is definitely true and probably an extreme to that given the hours. And so being able to catch, um, be aware of how quickly you're burning the candle at both ends, know that you are on the track to burning out and being able to mitigate that, I think is a pretty important skill in banking and it's kind of critical to long-term success. Uh, managing up is honestly like, it's a kind of a basic answer, but I feel like it's pretty important. Like as long as you prove yourself and you prove that you are dependable and reliable, most people are very like understanding of like, I will take time for myself and they trust that you're going to get stuff done. And so like, as soon as you build that social capital, being able to communicate that clearly allows you to have a little bit more work-life balance. Um, also where I worked, they had protected Saturdays, which were usually pretty protected, which is great. Can you explain? <laughs> most people don't know what protected Saturdays is. And it's yeah. gonna, it might sound absurd to some people who haven't been in banking, <laughs> but can you explain what Protected yeah, Saturdays so are? So the concept of Protected Saturdays is that you will not be asked to work from at some point in time Friday evening until for us it was 9 a.m. Sunday. Um, and I think that's a pretty big difference because in a lot of banks that don't have Protected Saturdays, it means you may not work over the weekends as much, but you always have to be on and checking your phone. Whereas I did not check my phone on Saturdays. I did not check email on Saturdays and in a work environment or industry where you're kind of expected to reply to an email in 10 minutes, um, it, it gives your brain a huge break in being able to sign off for a day. Um, even if it's just to catch up on sleep. Yeah. yeah. I remember when I first left banking, the first thing in my mind was, wow, I don't have to check my email. It's, it's like hard to explain how much you have to be responsive on email and how, it, especially because we had it, and I think you guys might have also had their, the email app on your personal phones. Yep. So then it's like, there's no break, at least for my experience. And so, um, but I, since we talked about Protected Saturdays, I'm also curious to hear if um, at Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan, like what they did to give you guys um, protected time, if, if at all. Well, I know at JP Morgan, what they used to do, but yeah, yeah, great we, if you could elaborate we, on it. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. No, we we have something similar. Um, it's it's not a full Saturday, but it's fr Friday to Saturday. We get Friday night off and Saturday morning, and yeah, it's uh, it makes a complete difference. Just being in, like know that you you'll be able to plan something for Friday night or Saturday morning, and you don't have to worry about emails. But you were saying that that's that stress of having to look at your email at any point in time, knowing you have to reply immediately. Once you get that off, like it's it's a big relief. Um, so I really I really appreciated that 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 time off. And also they did everything they could to respect it. So I think from that, from that side, it's a very good culture in the sense that they would really try to avoid sending you anything over the protected sign time or, or they would say, Let, let's have this meeting on Friday at, at noon so that you'll have time to finish it right before 6 PM and we can all sign off. So mm -hmm. that's, that's something I really appreciate. Did they still have protected weekends? Maybe. No. Oh, they got rid of that. So it's all Friday right. to Saturday. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. How Morgan, about Morgan, Morgan Stanley? Stanley does not have a protected Saturday or mm. protected weekend. Um, so it was people dependent. And I found that the culture of the people was super exceptional. So we had, a, I had a VP that over one weekend, he gave us a heads up on Thursday, said, guys, it's ramping up. The client looks like they need and want one, two, three, four, five. I give you a heads up for Saturday and Sunday. It's going to be a little bit busy. So if you were planning to maybe say do a museum and respond on the go, I would advise maybe just stick around by your laptop. Uh, it's a full working day. So having people 
be able to anticipate that kind of busyness and even just like respecting your humanity enough to even give you that heads up and recognize that um, it's, you know, it's a little bit of an, an ask. It was, it was great. And I found that it was universal. So many people across the building were actually so good at being able to tell you, hey, I would really like for this to be done. If Friday night they know that something will happen over the weekend, they'll give you that heads up. And even on the weekends, I found for myself, some sometimes, especially if it's not too crazy, I could just say, hey, Sunday morning for the two hours, can I go to church in the morning? Mm. And that was great, being able to communicate. And on the other side, if it if if I could calculate this level of uh, responsibility I needed to, to take, I was able to communicate that and people were really respectful of that. So the culture in the firm, even though we didn't have protected Saturdays and weekends, the culture was so respectful and acknowledging of people's needs of like, I guess, basic humanity. Hmm. And do you have something? Yeah, no, to just, just, just to echo on, on the communication part, that's something I learned on the job, the importance of communication in, in all aspects, not just saying, hey, I'm going to have a, a busy weekend. Is there any way someone can, could cover? But also in your, in your day to day, whenever you're getting 10 tasks at a time, just don't say just to everything and then don't deliver because that's the worst you can do. But as long as you communicate and say like, hey, I might, I might start doing this in three hours or four hours, people are in general like pretty cool. So communication probably the most important yeah skill set in, in banking. Sorry to interrupt, but just wanted to let you guys know about today's video sponsor, which is Wall Street Prep. And I'm guessing you're interested in this video because you might be interested in breaking into investment banking. And I highly recommend checking out the financial modeling courses at Wall Street Prep. Wall Street Prep offers financial modeling courses so you can be ready not just for interviews, but your job on the desk as a banker. And what I really like is that they have you dig into financial statements and build models using real numbers, just like what I used to do at JP Morgan. They offer a lot of great courses, but the two I particularly recommend are the accounting course, if you don't have any prior accounting knowledge, and then the premium modeling package, which has been taken by over 100,000 students and goes over all the key valuation concepts I learned in banking like DCFs, comps, accretion dilution, and LBOs. Wall Street Prep has been around since 2004, and they help train employees at all of the top banks and institutions in the world, including at Wharton, where my classmates have been att attending live instructor sessions. If you're interested in a course at Wall Street Prep, be sure to use my code RARELIQUID to get 20% off, and I'll leave a link to all of this in my description. For sure. And actually, Ed, I wanted to touch upon something you were talking about, which is kind of related to the culture uh, at Morgan Stanley. And I wanted to kind of put each of you guys on the spot a little bit. <laughs> and uh, and it wasn't too long ago. Re recruiting wasn't too long ago. Yeah. But I think a lot of times banks seem to kind of blend together because they all kind of seem to kind of work on doing the same thing, do the same thing. But there are actually huge differences across each bank. And so my question to each of you is what if you were kind of asked in an interview se setting, like why Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, you can either kind of just revert to your answer you said during recruiting if it stays, if it's all just, you know, the same. Or if you want to add something to that, basically what we're trying to do is provide additional insight for anyone who might be interested in recruiting in any of these firms, like what kind of uh, answer might be um, able to get you like a green check mark in an interview or something. So starting with Eunice. <laughs> okay. Why Goldman? Uh <laughs> Funnily enough, they don't ask that in interviews for mm. uh, Goldman Sachs. Why Goldman Sachs? Uh, I feel like that kind of also speaks to their culture. <laughs> uh, but one thing that I liked, one of the reasons that I like Goldman Sachs is I want to get wide exposure to finance. And it's one of the groups where you have m and in-house. So you get exposure to a lot of different product groups. Um, I am in the tech team, but within the tech team, I... I, you don't necessarily align to a sub vertical auto automatically. So you get exposed to a lot of sub verticals. And so I thought of all the groups, it is one where I could learn a lot um, in the broad landscape and the entire, I guess, like lifetime of a company. If I had to describe GS culture, though, which is, I think, the question that you really want answered uh, is uh, nice, a bit grindy, very FaceTime oriented. So that mm. I think is a differentiator. So while I didn't work Saturdays, I was in the office most Sundays and definitely every day, Monday through Thursday, Friday. Mm. Um, and so uh, pretty FaceTime oriented. Um, yeah, that's I guess that's how I would describe GS culture, at least okay. in my office. 
Yeah, and let me add that it is, everyone's experience is very different within the group you're in and also which city you're in. Mm. So we kind of, we might have, I think we covered this, but Eunice was in San Francisco, San Francisco and Ed and Alonzo were in New York and very different teams, right? So everyone's experience is very different across different teams and the culture and your experience is different. Yep. Um, yeah, for, for me, it was like, Actually, the, the opposite. Um, I, I, I knew I wanted to do a generalist in terms of industry. Um, so that's why I recruited for product groups. And not all, not all banks uh, had product groups. So I knew the M&A team at JP Morgan uh, is pretty good. Um, and I really like the people. Uh, JP Morgan goes through a very intensive coffee chat process. That's something that varies by, uh, bank to bank. Um, JP Morgan is probably one of the most thorough in terms of how many how many chats they want to have with you b before they invite you to to interview with them so i get i got a chance to meet a lot of people that i would actually work with w once once i got i got i got the offer so i think that was a big differentiator when i was trying to choose uh, uh, where to go uh because then once i got there i, I confirmed that 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 these people were very nice to work with it, it's a it's a very fast-paced environment um people are working all day but Everyone was very open to feedback, but also to mentorship. And whenever I had a question, everyone was willing to to answer, both analysts and associates, and also the the, the seniors. So every, everyone was was focused on, on on helping the interns and making sure everyone has has a, a good time uh, during the internship. So I, I guess that that was that was the main. And also, I, I when choosing banks, I wanted to be at an institution that was global and that would be. Um, uh, that, that 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 that's a big institution and that has a, a, a big footprint and and a big balance sheet and and well JP Morgan clearly clearly uh, feel that that requirement so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so yeah. that's the biggest bank in the yeah. world <laughs> yeah yeah so for me I think the biggest catch was the generalist program so Morgan Stanley has what's called a pool and what it is is when you're an intern you come into a pool of fellow interns. And when you get staffed, you get staffed across different types of teams. You're not placed with one specific team. So you get to explore the ones that you like. You get to have touch points with different products and industries. And then by the end of it all, when you come back full time, you get to do the same thing and then pick a team that you figured you liked and you gravitate towards. So that was a big catch for me coming from an industry agnostic background. I was in the finance world, but very industry agnostic in, the, in what I covered. So that was a big, big, big catch. Um, and then Alonso mentioned something very important for me was also the global reach. And I remember I, I texted my dad when I had the options that I was evaluating. And then he just said, whatever you decide, because the options were clearly global enough. And he's by no means in the finance world, but he was able to recognize that, okay, so I think this is whatever you'll make of the choices you have will be a good good choice. So that was that was good to see. And then of course, through throughout the, the recruiting process, I think I was fortunate enough that I didn't have a horrible coffee chat or horrible experience with any of the banks, quite honestly. So um, just connecting with the people that I spoke with was also an important thing. And I'm just fortunate that I didn't have anything on the negative side. So just the level of connection was, was very important and it helped when I was making the decision. But I think for people who are really undecided, unsure, or just draw to drawn to the pool. That's a very like a good, good, good uh, way to explore your 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 career in banking. Mm. And I think because a lot of people who are probably watching this, you know, forty five minute interview are probably interested in getting into banking. Otherwise, you know, why are you <laughs> listening or watching this? But can you guys share your top one to two tips, maybe uh, and tips about getting into banking? Ideally, something that, you know, may not come as conventionally or it's not as easy to kind of hear about. Um, think about your own processes. And maybe we can first actually start off by describing a little bit what the MBA recruiting process is like for banking. And since Eunice is the Wharton Finance Club president, you can co start off a <laughs> co-president. You can help kind of and yeah. first, let us know what the process is like yeah, for MBAs. Um, first, I would preface that at the MBA level, uh, banking recruiting is very different by school. So the timelines are very different by school. And so depending on where you end up going, as uh, if you decide to get an MBA, your process might be a bit different. For Wharton, uh, recruiting uh, formally kicks off during what we call Opportunity Week. A lot of employers, including banks, come and have information sessions. That's the formal start. 
Then you have a series, several rounds of coffee chats, I would say. Um, some are structured, others are self-sourced. Uh, the number of coffee chats varies by bank. As Alonzo said, JPM is known to be very high touch. Um, you have a series of invite only events, so receptions or dinners, and then you get a first round invite somewhere if you're recruiting for New York, which most of Wharton does um, sometime early December ish. And then your first rounds are in January. Um, you have a bit like about a month to prep, I would say, for technicals and your first round interviews. Your first uh, round interviews are first and second week of January. And then a few days later, you have a super day, which is usually a series of interviews. So anywhere from three to four to five to six. Um, and then we get our offers. Um, yep, and then you're yeah. free. Uh, and then <laughs> until you, the summer. <laughs> and then you have to decide. Hope, hopefully you get more than one offer. And so you uh, end up de- trying to decide where you want to go. Yeah, and yeah. I, I didn't take part, of course, in the banking recruiting process, but I did also think I heard that you match or you uh, rank your top banks. Is that right? And then the banks kind of rank their candidates and then For you kind of get matched. For New York. For New York. Okay. Yeah, which I think I did not go through, actually. Um, I'm aware of this, but I didn't go through and Alonzo and Ed have. And so you could probably ask them what their experience was like ranking. Um, but it's think of it kind of similar to med school matching or like resident um like in medicine, resident matching. So you kind of rank your preferences and the banks rank you. Yeah, is that pretty much? I, I don't know how med school ranking works. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, not super <laughs> common. Yeah. Though, so, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, the way it works is um, you once you get to interview, so this is very much at the end of, of the process and you already know which banks you're interviewing with. Um, you know the banks. You kind of have an idea of what your top choices would be. If you got an offer, you are asked to, to rank them um, and the banks will also rank all their candidates and this is group specific. So each group within each bank will rank their top candidates and then there will be a deadline. Um, in our case, it was actually the last interview day and then that same day we got the offers. Um, and the way the system works is it's an algorithm that tries to optimize your first two choices and the bank's first two choices and get a match. And the idea is to try, try to make sure that as many uh, students get at least one offer. Uh, as compared to, this is relatively new, I think, uh, because before, and, and this is also happening in, in our schools, basically there's no limit and, and students can get 15 offers and then there are many other students who don't get any. So I think it's in general a, a fair system. Mm. How did you guys feel when you guys got your offers? <laughs> Excited. <laughs> um, yeah. It was a big relief. Yeah. The recruiting process is such a stressful period. I remember there was a time I was, walking to the bus in New York from an event. Uh, in fact, it started right after leaving the bank's building, walking out, it started raining and my Uber started canceling. And then I tried to stand roadside, curbside to hail down a taxi and none of them would stop. And then fast forward, I eventually found a car, got to the bus and I was drenched in the, my head to toe. My whole suit was just wet and drove all the way to Philly shivering yeah. right oh, uh, and this is yeah. around midnight so it was it was just thinking about that level of uh, pain and the level of uh, challenge that you had to go through to eventually see the output um, was just such a relief uh, I remember I was literally walking into an aircraft as I was taking a flight and so my phone was going to be off when I was up there and I hoped and prayed that it didn't happen while my phone was off Unfortunately, just look, I received the calls when I was uh, walking into the, the, the aircraft. Oh, perfect timing. It, was, it just took such, the, the weight was so much off my shoulders. I think I slept the whole flight. <laughs> <laughs> just the joy. Yeah. For, for me, continuing with the stories, uh, I think the first thing that came to mind was those 6 a.m. early walks to the train station in Philly to get, catch the oh train to God. New York. <laughs> Freezing, because Peruvians are not used to that weather. Um, <laughs> Freezing and, and walking and just thinking this is going to be over soon. Um, so yeah, definitely once once we got the offers, it was a relief. Like it felt so good. Yeah. Eunice, yeah, how about you? Um, I remember my. I remember when I got the call. Uh, so she the it happened to be the staffer at GS. Uh, this is the call that I'm 
referencing, she started off being like, yeah, it was a really tough year in recruiting. Like, as you know, the market isn't doing too well. I was like, oh, it's okay. Um, I don't think, I don't even think I was this happy when I found out I got into Wharton, to be honest, or like got any other job. Because that's just how hard you have to work. Um, And you're in an environment where everyone, it's not just you, like you see everyone really trying their best. Um, And so many different ways, you're just trying to balance so much. um, And it kind of, there is a little bit of anxiety of like, will this work out in the end? Because you've just put in so much and you've actually sacrificed a a big chunk of your time at, at your MBA for this. And so I think a lot of relief. I felt pretty happy, I would say. And then... Um, yeah, so it was a, I, I do remember it. I was sitting at my desk, um, got a call and I think I like kind of screamed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, if I think about when I got my JPM offer, it was so long ago, but I think I got the call at home and I was super excited, but then I told my ex-girlfriend at the time and then she was very like mixed about it because of like the work-life balance issue. And so, but <laughs> Then I went to like this Cabo spring break trip and then had a lot of fun after uh, I told all my friends. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, huge relief. How about we actually go into how to get into banking? Um, any like tips for recruiting that come to mind? Uh, Starting with Alonzo. Sure. Um, so something that no one told me and that I think is it's important is don't underestimate the very early coffee shots. Um, I think we were told, or at least the message I, I received at the beginning from the banks during their information session, et cetera, was that the first coffee chats were just, you know, to meet to meet you and to learn about the bank and and to get where information you need. But then I found out that not really. Um, you are getting evaluated since day one. Um, so you have to be sharp. And, and something that helped me at least was um, knowing what I wanted in terms of group, in terms of which bank I preferred. Uh, and having like a solid pitch uh, and a solid story prepared since the very beginning. Of course, you, you develop it and, and you improve it as you go. Uh, but I do think the first impression is very powerful, and and so you should not you should not underestimate it. Mm. Ed, I would say teamwork makes the dream work. Mm-hmm. I had a team of guys that I prepared with, and one thinking my view of the world was that there's enough that all of us will get jobs so we weren't competitive with each other and so we worked well really well together to prep our resumes to prep our stories to prep for coffee chats like Alonso said because from every from from day one every interaction is evaluative so we just made sure to do that so uh, getting a team of people who you will share resources with who you will be vulnerable in front of before you become vulnerable in front of the bankers Mm. and those that who will push you uh, I had a friend who would call me between classes at night and just like ask me a random question, like a behavioral, like, tell me about a time when you did want to. Do, and, I, and I had to answer because we we had that agreement. So that was, that's something that I really would stress. Um, t- teamwork makes the dream. work. Got it. The midnight calls is not a usual way to rec- <laughs> re- prepare for recruiting, but I guess it worked. But Eunice, how about you? Um, one tip that comes to mind? Okay. Well, I feel like there are so many like practical tips. What do you want? A practical tip or more like self-reflection of like- uh, the Let's do process? one of each then. Okay. Practical tip. Um, be super organized. Um, I like little things like don't book coffee chats back to back because one might run late, create a buffer. Think about how long it takes to walk somewhere or set up a computer, or, like build in buffer times because I think that's what causes stress. Um have a super organized email track, like Excel tracker of all of your contacts. I That helped me a bunch of times. Honestly, I think I cl- talked to close to 200 people during recruiting. And so um, no matter how good your memory is, you will not remember 200 variations of the same conversation. Um, and then on a personal level, I think this is a bit of a hot take, I think, in banking. I've heard like this was kind of I just decided to do this, but I was pretty authentic during my recruiting process. So similar to Alonso, I was pretty struck, pretty targeted in my recruiting. I was recruiting for the West Coast. I was recruiting for tech teams. Um, and like during my like why banking or like what's your top banks or like all the questions that you get asked, I was 
pretty honest. Um, and I think that, like, if you think about it, we will be bankers in a few years. We will be recruiting. And like, I think we have the ability to tell, hopefully tell when someone's faking it or not. And so I think that that worked out for me. Like, I tried to be as authentic and sincere as I could. Um, and I think that bankers were receptive to that. Um, mm. You yeah. never felt like you were being too honest or are you being authentic to a certain point and... You know, is there any ever any line or? Yeah, I would say like be professional. Like I'm not gonna go. I almost cried in an office once, <laughs> but uh, I like I was always professional. But I think that some people they feel like they need to either have a different persona during recruiting or be like super hardcore. Um, I still laughed. I mean, we're still talking to people in coffee chats. They're not robots, and so I tried to. I think that was what worked well for me is um, always be prepared, whether that's like be prepared to talk about a deal or like talk about your hobbies or whatever they ask for. But um, just trying to be sincere and not fake it, I think was helpful. Got it. And um, I think kind of to wrap things up pretty, uh, or to wrap things up, I think we, I wanted to ask more of like a reflective question since we have sometimes a younger audience that watches so I'm curious to know if you guys could go back in college and then tell yourself, give yourself some advice as to anything career or personal related. Uh, it could be one of each or just one. What would you tell your former self? One is do more practical things. So actually model a company that exists when you're in college. For me, I was a finance major. So modeling a company that exists and doing something that is real because that replicates what the future will look like and in, in an actual job. So that's an important thing that I, if I were to redo, I'd probably include a little bit more of that in my, in my college years. And if same thing, if say, for example, you're recruiting VC or you're a musician, do things that are actually translate in the real life um, in your college years. And then personal level, Hmm. I'd say don't sleep on your hobbies because we are inalienable from ourselves and our interests. And it's those little moments of humanity that make people connect. So you'd be surprised at how important it is for you to be a holistic human being who can hold a conversation because that is appealing to clients and that is appealing to your colleagues. So just don't underestimate the power and importance of just being a fully developed human being with interests and hobbies that will take you a long way. You know, even if selfishly in your career, you use that as a key to get into places that can help. Mm. Love the life advice. <laughs> um, I would tell myself to travel more uh, mm. if possible. Um, get out of my comfort zone. Try to discover the world, do things I don't think about doing. Uh, and just use the time because the truth is time just shortens as you as you grow. So use it as, as much as you can. Um, as Ed was saying, uh, nurture your hobbies, but also find your hobbies. Why not? Um, and, 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 you know, like no matter what you do, you, you're, you're young, so you can, you can mess up. You can, you can get a bad job. You can try a new industry. You'll be fine. Um, so don't stress about that. Um, and then maybe some, something that I would do more is, uh, more on the professional side is, um, just try to be as curious as possible, read every day what's going on in the world, what's going on, not just in my country, but anywhere in the world, be up to date um, and have those conversations with people because I think then once you are, that doesn't have to be banking, but when you're doing uh, any job, have it, having developed that skill set of being up to date, of being able to have an, a smart conversation about things will make a, a big difference. So mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's important. I think I would echo the theme of curiosity. Um, and this is both a personal and professional thing. Um, I didn't study finance in undergrad. I was a history and classics double major, but I was super focused on history and classics as an undergrad. Um, and I would tell myself to explore. Um, so to pursue new passions, try new courses. Like you think, I think uh, a lot of people, myself included in undergrad, we are very goal oriented in our undergrad, um, whether that is, I need to get into a grad school or a grad program. I need to get a job. I want to become a banking analyst. Um, and all the steps that you take in your college years are steps towards that goal. 
Um, and anything that deviates from it, you think it's like just a waste of your time or effort. But I would say no. I think in exploring those paths and kind of taking a more security, circuitous path, um, you become a whole person through that process. And so take the electives that seem weird and random. Um, maybe do the readings for those classes. <laughs> um, like find new hobbies, do stretch experiences, travel to places, or travel with people you may not necessarily want to things like that, because the space and time to do all of those things just disappears with time. And so um, it is helpful to know yourself earlier. Yeah. What about you, Mr. Ray Liquid? Yeah. Oh, personal and career? Yeah. Oh, putting me on the spot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was totally not prepared to be asked a question. Uh, personal, what would I tell myself? I would try to get myself more comfortable with risk, ASAP. And as a lot of you guys know, I was in the more traditional route where I was in banking and then I took the risk to be an entrepreneur. And I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur since I was 10. And so now I feel like I'm almost, when I talk to my friends about entrepreneurship, I feel like I'm almost trying to spread the gospel in a sense of like, oh, I have this thing that's so amazing. And you know, if you're a Christian and you're talking to an atheist, like it's hard to really translate what you're trying to say. And I think... For me, when I think about like when even when I'm in the classroom at Wharton and people are answering questions, there's I can tell a lot of people are a lot smarter than me. But the reason I have a business is just that I was willing to take a risk. And, you know, of course, they could still make more, way more money than me and whatever. That's not really what I'm trying to get at. It's more just more that I feel like I was able to only get to where I am now and really pursue my passion because I took a risk. And I tell myself to kind of try to do that earlier, maybe start a business don't think that you don't have any good ideas or whatever. And then career-wise, I think it's I it's super hard to make your passion your career. And I think sometimes you might be a little bit scared to make a hobby into a career because you might your hobby might be uh, no longer a hobby or something like that. It might get kind of dull or boring. But I think if there are any intersections where you can do something you enjoy and make money at the same time, then I think that's a very sustainable way for you to pursue a career kind of. And in the long run, I think you won't have any like regrets doing that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I would say. With that, I would uh, just like to thank you guys for spending your time and this evening um, chatting and giving a lot of advice to everyone. And um so yeah, thank you guys so much. Unless you guys have any last thoughts or questions for each other. Nope. Thanks All for right. having thanks us. Thanks for, for having, having us. us. No problem. Thanks, guys. Bye. All right. So that concludes the interview. I hope you all enjoyed. And I wanted to also let you guys know that I'm building out my own how to get into investment banking course that's going to cover things like recruiting overview, industry overview, resume cover letter, behaviorals and technicals. And so feel free to sign up for that. You can get a 50% discount if you sign up early. With that said, thank you guys all so much for listening and tuning in. With that said, hope to catch you all in the next episode. Thanks so much all and peace out.